afternoon. Now, we have spent the beginning of this course trying to get genomes into cells. We talked about that last time. Now we're going to start going through the different parts of the replication cycle. And in the end, we're going to end up assembling uh, new virus particles uh, in four or five lectures or so. Today I want to talk about RNA viruses and how they make RNA uh, from their genomes, RNA-directed RNA synthesis. Now, a little bit of history, and uh, this is just, you don't have to know this, obviously. I wouldn't ever ask you this, so that you know where this stands in the history of science, because that's an interesting thing. So tobacco mosaic virus, remember the first virus to be discovered at the end of the 1800s. Uh, that virus was crystallized in 1935, actually at Princeton University, first virus to be crystallized. In other words, they made crystals of it. 1936, it was found that those crystals contained 5% RNA. This was surprising. People didn't know what the RNA meant. Now, in 1944, we talked about the experiment showing in bacteria that DNA is the genetic material, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, famous experiment. 1952, Hershey Chase, which we talked about, showing uh, that the DNA of a bacteriophage is the genetic material. Structure of DNA in 1953. And then three years later, uh, it was shown that the nucleic acid of tobacco mosaic virus, the RNA, is actually infectious. First demonstration that RNA can be genetic material. And as, as we mentioned, the way that was done is they extracted RNA from the particle, pure RNA, and transfected it into plant cells. And out came new virus particles. So that RNA was infectious, it was obviously the genetic material. By 1959, RNA was found in many, many animal viruses, and then that began studies on how this molecule could replicate. Because as you know, our genetic material, and out of everything else that we knew on the planet, is DNA. So this finding of RNA in viruses was puzzling. How did it replicate? How did it lead to the production of mRNA? And that's what we're going to talk about today. We've made a lot of progress since the 1960s. And on our Baltimore scheme, uh, the viruses we're going to talk about are the group three, the double-stranded RNA viruses like rheoviruses and rotaviruses, uh, the group uh, five, the negative strand RNA genomes, influenza viruses, vesicular stomatitis virus, and the viruses with plus stranded RNA, like poliovirus, these do not go through a DNA intermediate. Group six gets its own lecture because it's so cool. And we're going to talk about those RNA viruses today because they go through a DNA intermediate. But these plus stranded RNA viruses go through an RNA intermediate, an R negative strand intermediate. Now, many people ask me about this. Why? Why do you have to have a negative strand here on this Baltimore scheme? And in a way, it's puzzling, I understand, because the plus RNA is, is actually mRNA. And for all of these other uh, viral genomes, uh, we're looking at intermediate steps from getting to their genome to mRNA. So this has an extra step in that you do not need a negative strand in order to be translated for those viruses. But I think, if you look back at the original Baltimore paper in the 70-something, it's got this in it. Now, the point here is that to make more mRNA, you have to go through a negative strand intermediate. But rest assured that these viruses, group four, the plus-stranded RNA is infectious, and it is mRNA. Now, here's one of the first experiments showing uh, in cells infected with a poliovirus-like virus, uh, it was called mengovirus, that, in fact, you get an RNA polymerase activity. So this is the first identification of the RNA polymerase. So what was done here was to infect cells with an animal virus. These are mouse cells infected with a mouse virus. And then at different hours post-infection, uh, you can see the hours on the x-axis, what they did was they took a little bit of the cells and did a plaque assay. And the PFU per mil are plotted here on the right-hand y-axis. And that's the dotted line. And then uh, on the left hand, they made extracts of cells, and they incubated them with, four, with the four NTPs, nucleoside triphosphates, the precursors of RNA, one of which was labeled uh, with, well, it's probably tritium, knowing what they did back then. And then they measured the incorporation of this tritiated nucleoside triphosphate into RNA. And that's the solid line here. 
<clears throat> so what you can see, uh, right after infection, by one and two hours, there's an eclipse period, right, where you don't see any infectivity. That's because the genome has uncoded. And then between two and three hours, you see the production of infectious particles. Eventually, within five or six hours, that peaks. So typical infectious, one-step one growth curve. And then you can see paralleling the production of virus is the production of RNA. So this is an RNA virus, and what we're seeing in cells is the production of RNA. So somehow this genome is being replicated. And that, how that happened was a puzzle, because no one knew, first of all, this is 1960s. Nobody has any genome sequence, so we don't know what viral genomes encode. And so people thought, well, this RNA must be replicated by the cell. So people spend many years trying to figure that out, and then eventually they realize that the production of RNA was done by an RNA virus enzyme. That was the first uh, evidence for RNA synthesis in RNA virus infected cells. Eventually, RNA polymerases, so that activity was ascribed to an RNA dependent RNA polymerase, a, an enzyme that nobody had really seen before. Uh, it was eventually discovered in the particles of negative strand viruses. So those, the experiment I just showed you was done with a plus-stranded RNA virus, and there's no polymerase in the particle. But for negative strand RNA viruses, there is polymerase uh, in the particle because negative strands upon entry into the cell, the cell can't do anything with it. The plus strands can be translated and you can make a polymerase from that, but the minus strands can't be translated, so they have to bring in a polymerase with them. And the example, uh, we'll talk about today, vesicular stomatitis virus and influenza virus. Those were our two negative strand prototype viruses. Eventually, we got to do genome sequencing and identified the coding region for these polymerases. We could synthesize recombinant proteins. We could produce these proteins in E. coli and show that they had catalytic activity. We found, we did sequence alignments and found conserved motifs like this one, GDD, GLI-ASP, ASP, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment. And now we have crystal structures of many of these polymerases today. And that's going to drive some of our discussion. So let's, let's look at this, uh, the situation with RNA and the virus particle. These are these viruses uh, with RNA genomes that we're talking about today. Negative strand RNA genomes, as I've said, are coated with protein. VSV, the RNA is present in an RNA protein complex, the ribonucleoprotein, the nucleocapsid. Uh, influenza virus, the same thing, except that it's segmented. And again, that's because the negative strand, if it were naked in the particle, upon getting into the cell, could do nothing. The cell cannot replicate it. So the virus has to bring in a polymerase within the particle, okay, with those negative strand RNA viruses. The second line, the plus strand RNA genomes, poliovirus, flavivirus, those are the two uh, types we're going to talk about mainly in this course for these plus strand viruses. The RNA is naked in the particle. That's because nothing else is needed in order to initiate an infection. The viral RNA is infectious because it's plus stranded. As soon as it gets into the cell, it's translated by the cell. It's ribosome ready. And all the proteins are then made to replicate the genome, including the RNA polymerase. Now, there are exceptions to this uh, plus stranded RNA genomes are naked. Always an exception. Retroviruses. These are unusual because the RNA is not translated when it comes into the cell. It's reverse transcribed, and the reverse transcriptase is associated with the RNA, so it's not naked. And then the coronaviruses. This is weird, because these are plus-stranded RNA genomes. They're the same class as the picornaviruses and the flaviviruses. You know, I'm not really sure why they should be coated with protein. Maybe because the RNAs are so long, and that's to protect them. And finally, we have viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes. The, can this double-stranded RNA be translated in the cell? No, it cannot. Double-stranded, it can't access that mRNA strand. So the virus, the double-stranded RNA virus particles have to also contain an RNA polymerase in the particle so that when that RNA comes into a cell, it can be made into mRNA. So if you look at the structure of these genomes, you can sort of figure out readily what happens as soon as they infect cells. Now, the negative-strand RNA viruses, as I've said, the RNA is always complex with proteins. That includes typically a nucleoprotein. We talked about that for vesicular stomatitis virus. It's like the capsid protein of tobacco mosaic virus, except VSV is envelope. So here at the bottom is a schematic of the bullet-shaped 
nucleocapsid. It's a single protein, the nucleocapsid protein shown in blue here, which binds to the RNA shown in green. And of course, the RNA is coiled up and the capsid protein wraps around it. So the capsid or the nucleocapsid proteins interact with each other as well as with the RNA. That forms a helical structure. And on the top is the crystal structure of a few of these molecules of N nucleocapsid protein bound to RNA. So the nucleocapsid protein is in blue. You can see it has two main lobes. And then there's a groove in the middle, and that's where the RNA fits in, which is this uh, green strand fitting across it here. So there's an RNA binding domain in this protein and a protein-protein binding domain as well. So uh, that's bound to the RNA. In addition, the, the virus also brings in a molecule of the RNA polymerase because that has to initiate infection. Influenza virus on the right, same idea, except that the genome is segmented. Each of the eight negative strand RNA segments is bound up with viral proteins, uh, which include a nucleoprotein and a polymerase. Uh, on the top here is a crystal structure of the RNA protein complex. Each protein, each nucleoprotein is shown uh, in, in a space filling diagram uh, in pink, uh, and then uh, the RNA is bound to it. Now remember that RNA is not just a straight squiggly line. It has extensive secondary and tertiary structure. What do I mean by that? Well, here are some examples of secondary structures on, the, on panel A. A, a. RNA sequence can, find, can form a stem loop, which is shown at the left, when uh, there are complementary bases in the linear sequence. So they form base pairs, they form a stem, and typically loops are unbase paired. These stem loop structures can be quite extensive and complicated. You can have multi-branched loops. You can have bulges in the side of them. You can have interior loops as well. Uh, and uh, they have roles in genome expression of the RNA synthesis and translation. Proteins bind to these loops typically, and they mediate a variety of functions. One kind of loop that we'll talk about now and then in this course is shown in panel B. And this is called a pseudo-knot because it's not really a knot, but it looks like one. And what happens here is you have a stem loop, and then some uh, bases in the loop are complementary to downstream bases. They're shown in this picture by the dotted lines. And so they base pair in the next panel below. You can see that they, they, find, they form two uh, base paired stems, if you will. And if you look at the structure of these, these look sort of like the RNA is knotted around itself, but it's not. The RNA is actually not knotting. It just looks like it, so that's why it's called a pseudonaut. It's a special kind of secondary structure. And again, these have functions, uh, as you'll see, in viral genomes. Now, there are two main rules about viral RNAs that we have to remember that govern the way infection proceeds. There's an RNA molecule at the top shown in just a squiggly line, but remember, it's not. First is that the genome has to be copied from end to end without losing any sequence. Obviously, if you want to make new viruses, you have to take what comes into the cell, copy it faithfully from end to end, and then you can get a new genome. If you leave sequence out, you're not going to be able to get an infectious RNA. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's obvious, right? But I'm going to show you some examples of RNA synthesis where the ends are not copied, and that has to be accounted for. So no loss of nucleotide sequence when you're replicating the genome. And next, you have to produce viral RNAs messenger RNAs that can be translated by the ribosomes of the host cell. And this goes all the way back to our first session where we said you know, viruses are parasites of the cellular translation machinery. No virus encodes a translation system. They all depend on the host. So it, the virus has to make mRNA that's recognized by the host. And you may think, well, isn't it just RNA? It's not. It's got certain features that are needed to be there in order to be translated. We will talk about that in more detail later in a translation lecture. All right, copying, faithful copying, and making mRNAs that can be translated. Now, sometimes the genome is the same as the mRNA for some viruses. It's exactly the same. And sometimes it's not. That's pretty easy, right? So for some viruses, the mRNAs are totally different. In fact, they're not even complete copies of the genome. But for some uh, viruses, they are. And we'll see examples of that uh, in a bit. RNA-directed RNA synthesis uh, follows a, a set of rules which are very similar to the rules uh, for DNA-directed DNA synthesis. It begins and terminates at specific sites on the template. 
RNA synthesis isn't random. Polymerase doesn't jump all over and start copying. It starts at very specific places and terminates at specific places. The polymerase, and here RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, that's our abbreviation, uh, it may need a primer or it may not. So it can be primer dependent or uh, initiate what we say de novo or without a primer. Now cellular DNA dependent RNA polymerase, that's the cell enzyme that makes mRNAs in us. Uh, that does not need a primer to make mRNAs. It needs a specific sequence called a promoter, but it doesn't need a primer. So many RNA polymerases are like that, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. They don't need a primer, but some of them do, and we'll talk about that in detail today. Uh, besides the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, other proteins are needed to make viral RNA. Sometimes they're vir there are always other viral proteins, and sometimes even cellular proteins are needed. RNA is made by template-directed, so you need a template, stepwise incorporation of NTPs elongated in a 5 to 3 prime direction. But there are examples of non-templated synthesis. They're rare. We're not going to talk about them too much here. But that is what that means simply is that sometimes the polymerase is not copying a template. It's just sticking in bases, extra bases that aren't coded for. And that, that's pretty rare, but it does happen. So mostly templated synthesis, but there are examples of non-templated systems as well. So let's talk a little bit about primers first. Uh, these this slide uh, illustrates de novo initiation and primer dependent initiation. So at the top, we have uh, two examples of de novo initiation. The very top line you have, we're looking at an RNA, of course, at the three prime end is on the left. That's where synthesis begins. And here, the polymerase simply uh, puts the first NTP in that is complementary to the very three prime base on the RNA. So there's no primer needed. The polymerase can recognize the three prime and start adding complementary bases. The second bar is a version of that where the polymerase initiates internally. So here it's putting a G as the first base uh, complementary to this U, begins to polymerize, and then it slips back. And because of the nature of the sequence, uh, that can work. It's just a variation on the theme. I give it to you to be complete. But the main point here is that these are two mechanisms of initiation without a primer. The bottom are, are two examples of primer-dependent initiation that we know of uh, among RNA viruses. And the first, the primer is a protein. It's actually a protein where uh, it's linked to a NTP. And that protein NTP serves as the primer for RNA synthesis. Uh, for other viruses that we'll talk about, the primer is actually a capped primer. Uh, I'm not sure if you, all of you know this, but a cap is a structure at the five prime end of messenger RNAs, which has an unusual chemical structure. So we call it a cap. It's needed for many processes, including RNA synthesis. And for some viruses we'll talk about today, a cap primer is used for RNA synthesis. All right, the mechanism of catalysis. I think this is something, if you've taken uh, biology or biochemistry, you probably learned and promptly forgot after the exam, so I'm just reviving your, me your memory. On the upper left is a schematic of what we're looking at. We have a template strand of RNA. Now this is labeled DNA polymerase because pretty much the same for DNA uh, and RNA. And in fact, the bases here are DNA bases, but the mechanisms are similar. Uh, we have a strand, a template strand, and then we have a primer in the case of those uh, for, for enzymes that need a primer. Uh, the primer hybridizes to the template, and then new bases are added to the three prime end such that the new strand is, is synthesized in a five to three prime direction. And of course, you're reading the template in a three to five prime direction. Both DNA and RNA synthesis proceed by a two metal mechanism of catalysis. So let's look at what that means here on the right. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I'm going to show you in the structure exactly where this happens, because now we know. This was formulated many years ago before we had any structures of polymerases, and now we know exactly how this works. So here is a template strand on the very right from the three prime to the five prime direction. And there are just four bases shown here, G, T, A, T. And then on the left is a primer strand of, of a, a couple of bases. And then the last base has been added here, this T complementary to the A. Of course, this is DNA. If it were RNA, it would be U. Uh, and then uh, a bond, a phosphodiester bond is being formed. 
This last T has been brought in, and you can see the sugar ring, the ribose ring, and then we have the three phosphates, because these are brought in as NTPs, DNTPs. Uh, and then these phosphates are held in place in the active site by two metal ions, magnesium, two magnesium ions, which are in turn coordinated by two aspartate residues in the polymerase. So that's what you see, ASP-C and ASP-A. These are amino acids from the polymerase that hold the magnesium ions into place. And those magnesium ions catalyze uh, the breakage of the phosphate bonds that releases energy and allows the formation of a phosphodiester bond. So you get rid of two phosphates, these last two, the beta and the gamma phosphate, and you're left with the alpha phosphate, which remains between each base. All right, so the, the NTP becomes, loses two uh, phosphates, becomes, becomes a single phosphate in between the bases, and all of that is catalyzed by these two metals held in place at the active site uh, of the enzyme. And we're going to see how exactly that happens. We're going to have some structures coming up with the polymerase active site, which I'm sure you're very excited about. But before we can see those, we have to look at a, a question here. And this is, which is a universal rule about RNA-directed RNA synthesis? The RNA polymerase may initiate de novo or require a primer. RNA synthesis initiates randomly on the RNA template. RNA synthesis is, uh, is synthesized in a three to five prime direction. RNA synthesis is always template directed. All right, the answer is, is A. That's a universal rule. The polymerase may initiate de novo or require a primer. None of you selected B because, because that's, that's not correct. The RNA synthesis is not randomly initiated. Uh, synthesis in the three to five prime direction the, the template is copied in a three to five prime directed, but synthesis is always five to three prime. And it's always template directed. Um, it, I mentioned in one of the slides that there are rare occasions of non-template directed RNA synthesis. Now, when you compare all the polymerases that we know of in terms of sequence, you find out some interesting things. This is an alignment of the four different kinds of nucleic acid polymerase. We have RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which we're talking about today, and we have RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, reverse transcriptase. We have DNA-dependent DNA polymerase and DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That's the enzyme that makes mRNA, that last one. These all look very similar in terms of their 3D structures. And uh, the, when you align the sequences, they have some very conserved regions. And they're colored here, red, green, yellow, purple, and blue. And so basically, these probably all evolved from a common precursor that branched off into enzymes that could do different things. And I'm going to show you in, in the structure of the polymerase where these colored regions are in a moment. It turns out uh, that they're very important for the catalytic activity of the enzyme. So the catalytic area is very conserved, and the rest of the enzyme is less so. Now here in this C area, the yellow area that's conserved again among the four polymerases, uh, this is where the aspartates are that coordinate the magnesium metals that I showed you previously. And this area has a specific sequence in it depending on the kind of RNA virus we're looking at. In the plus strand RNA polymerases, there's a gliasp asp sequence. It's highly conserved. In fact, you can look at a protein sequence. If you find a gliasp asp, there's a good chance that it's an RNA polymerase. Uh, and those are the two aspartates that coordinate the magnesium ions during catalysis. In reverse transcriptase and the polymerases of segmented negative strand RNA viruses, the sequence is ASP, ASP. Uh, and in non-segmented minus strand polymerases like VSV, it's Gly, ASP, ASIN. Okay, so those are in the area that's very important for catalysis because they hold the magnesium uh, metals in place. So here's one structure, of, a 3D structure of a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase followed by X-ray crystallography. It's polioviruses, uh, 3D polymerase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And all these polymerases, and again, I have the alignments of all of them down here at the bottom. When you fold them, they all look like a right hand. It's shown here, I schematically showed a right hand, which is colored to show fingers and thumb domains. Those blue areas of the polymerase are the least conserved among all the four polymerases. Uh, these are parts of the protein that form the structure and are involved with interacting uh, with the template. The palm, which is yellow, is the most important part because it's the catalytic area. And I've, I've colored it yellow there in the diagram. 
but it's made up of the yellow, the green, uh, the red, and, and purple areas. All in the center here is the palm domain. Now remember the yellow area, uh, that's section C in the nomenclature, shown right here in the middle. That's where those two aspartates are. In fact, I've, I've drawn them in this structure as two adjacent uh, stick uh, diagrams. You can see the two side chains of the aspartates there. Those would be holding magnesiums, and that's where the catalysis would, would take place. So this is the business part of the enzyme. Again, if this were a positive strand RNA virus polymerase, and it is, it's polioviruses, you would find a GDD, you would find a Gly-ASP, ASP, highly conserved in all of these polymerases. This is a space-filling diagram of the same RNA polymerase to show you how catalysis occurs. This, this enzyme is actually completely encircled. The active site is encircled. I've removed some amino acids here on the right so you can get a better view of it. But it was basically, the polymerase is a closed structure. The active site is inside and there's a tunnel that passes in and out so the RNA, the template can get in and the template product can get out. So here we have in the middle of the, uh, of the protein that magenta area that is, those are the two aspartates with the two magnesiums uh, coordinated. Uh, I think you can see one of the, there's one of the magnesiums right there shown as a red ball. That's a magnesium ion being held by one of the aspartates. So that's the active site. And what happens is the template is shown uh, in cyan, comes into the top, passes past the active site and it's polymerized and then coming out the bottom of the enzyme uh, are both the template and the product. Obviously the, pro the template just comes in one end template and product come out the other end. So they pass very quickly over this active site and complementary nucleotides are added. This is an amazing process. It's pretty fast. And what happens is at every base, all four triphosphates try and fit in there and only the one that's complementary works. It happens for every position. And these enzymes do make mistakes as we will see. That's why life is so diverse because they make mistakes. I want to show you the structure of UTP bound to the poliovirus polymerase. Here's UTP on the right, uh, uridine triphosphate. That's the precursor that's going to be incorporated whenever there's an A on the template. And this shows you why this enzyme prefers NTPs and not DNTPs. So NTPs have two hydroxyls here as opposed to deoxyribonucleic acid, which would have in the two prime position just the hydrogen. Here's uh, UTP bound to the polymerase. So what they did is they made crystals of the polymerase and they added UTP to it and then they solved the structure. And here is the UTP bound. It's got the uridine, the uh, ribose ring, and the three phosphates. And you can see they make a variety of interactions with uh, amino acids in the polymerase. Those are shown in gray and in, in colors to hold the UTP in place. And here, are the, here is the yellow part of the active site. That's where the two aspartates are. This is aspartate here. 328 and 329, those are the two aspartates that coordinate the metal ion. But what I want to show you here is how this ASP at 238, it's quite far away in the linear sequence, but very close spatially, is interacting with the two prime hydroxyl of the UTP. If this were DNTP, uh, it would not fit in here because it wouldn't be able to form that hydrogen bond. So a single amino acid is determining whether the enzyme is going to accept a NTPs or DNTPs. I think that's very neat and that's something we only figured out by having the structure of these molecules. All right, so those are the molecular details about RNA synthesis. I want to back up a lot and look at the overview of how RNA synthesis occurs now that you understand the fundamentals. We'll start with plus strand RNA viruses. We're going to talk about two different kinds of genome strategies. The first is on the left, the plus strand viruses like picornaviruses and flaviviruses. These will be the viruses we talk about mostly. Picornavirus on the left, polio, flaviviruses, dengue, Zika, West Nile, and so forth. They both have uh, unimolecular plus-stranded RNA genomes. Uh, they replicate through a negative strand copy to make more RNA. And these are viruses for which the genome, which is in the particle, is exactly the same as mRNA. It's the same sequence. So what comes out of the particle is mRNA. When it's copied to negative and then back to plus, it's mRNA. And that mRNA can be either translated or put into virus particles. And then we'll talk about another kind of plus-stranded RNA virus uh, on the right in a bit. OK, so first, this is the overview of the poliovirus replication cycle. And we'll be talking about different aspects of this throughout the next five or six lectures. The viruses bind receptors 
get internalized. We talked about that last time. The RNA gets out of the particle and into the cytoplasm. That's where it needs to be. Most of the viruses we're going to talk about, the RNA viruses, that's where they replicate, in the cytoplasm. There are exceptions, of course, and we'll see one of those today, influenza virus. It replicates in the nucleus. Poliovirus RNA in the cytoplasm there can immediately be engaged by ribosomes. It's translated into viral proteins. And some of these viral proteins go on to replicate the viral genome. That's shown on the right slide in 8, 9, 10. And eventually, the new genomes that are produced get packaged into the virus particles made from these translated capsid proteins. Now, the RNA synthesis occurs on membranous vesicles that are induced by one of the viral proteins that are produced by the translation. And the replication goes from a plus RNA that comes in with the virus. It comes, it's copied into a negative strand, which is a complete copy of the plus strand. And then the negative strand is copied again to make more plus strand. The negative strand has one function, and only one, to serve as a template for the synthesis of plus strands. Those plus strands can then either be translated to make more protein, or later in infection, they can be packaged into new virus particles. So here's an example of a virus where the genome, and what I mean by genome, what is in the virus particle is the same as the messenger RNA. That won't be the case for all the viruses we talk about, but here's an example where the genome and mRNA are the same. Now here's a schematic of the poliovirus genome. Just to show you how it codes for all the proteins, it actually has a very long open reading frame that starts near the 5' end and goes all the way to the 3' end of the RNA. One long open reading frame, uh, just a few, uh, just a short stretch of non-coding region at the 5 and 3' end. The RNA is polyadenylated. It also has a protein linked to the 5' end called VPG. And that protein, as you're going to see in a minute, is the primer for RNA synthesis for this virus. So the genome is translated into a long protein. That protein is then chopped up by proteases that are encoded in the viral genome. And that's where you get all the individual viral proteins that you need, about a dozen. You have the polymerase here, 3D, and the capsid proteins up here on the left as examples. Let's take a look at the priming of RNA synthesis. Here's the very five prime end of the viral RNA. The first base is a U. It's linked to VPG, the protein. The VPG is about a 23 amino acid long protein. It's linked by a, a, a bond between a tyrosine on the protein and the first phosphate on the, on the uridine. Uh, then the, shown here is the next 30 bases or so of the genome, which form a, a cloverleaf-like structure. So this protein called VPG is very important. It is the primer for viral RNA synthesis. When you purify polioviruses, and extract the RNA, the only RNA in them is poliovirus RNA. And in infected cells, the only RNAs that are copied by the polymerase are poliovirus RNAs. And that's very interesting, because when a virus first infects a cell, there are lots of RNAs around. There are lots of messenger RNAs and ribosomal RNAs, right, floating around in the cytoplasm. The polymerase doesn't touch any of them. And we think that's because the viral RNA has specific signals, which are shown here. We have a pseudonaut at the three prime end. Remember, I explained, that's why I explained what a pseudonaut was. It's three prime poly A tail, a pseudonaut. We think that's important for targeting these to the polymerase. We have an internal stem loop structure, which is called CRE. And then finally, we have this cloverleaf structure at the five prime end in the VPG. We think these secondary structures are what make the polymerase distinguish viral RNAs from cellular RNAs. So, how does this all happen? The first thing, that happens in, during viral RNA synthesis is that a molecule of VPG gets two uridines added to it. We call that uridylation. So here's VPG uh, shown as an orange ball. It's uridylated on, a, on the structure in the genome that I just showed you called Cree. This is simply a stem loop structure, and uh, it can be present pretty much anywhere in the genome, but it's recognized by the RNA polymerase. This blue and, and pink molecule is the RNA polymerase. The Cree structure is recognized by the RNA polymerase, and then a molecule of, of VPG is brought in, and then the polymerase adds two U's to it. Where did the U's come from? Well, the, this loop, this, this loop at the tip of the Cree structure is all A's pretty much, and so those serve as templates for the addition of two U's. VPG UU is going to be the primer for RNA synthesis. So this is an enzyme that is primer dependent, the polio RNA polymerase. Primer is VPG with two U's on it, and the U's are added in this very interesting sequence of events. 
Uh, let's now put all of this together and talk about how the genome is replicated. This is interesting because the genome becomes circularized in order to be replicated. Let's start at the top here. We have uh, a molecule of viral RNA in green. We have the clover leaf, we have the Cree sequence in the middle, and we have the poly A tail with the pseudonaut. There's a, a protein in the cell called poly A binding protein, PABP, shown as a blue uh, oval there. It binds poly A. So it binds the three prime end of the polio genome. At the five prime end, there's a clover leaf structure which binds a cell protein that in turn is bound to membranes. So this whole RNA synthesis occurs on membranes, remember I told you, and this is how it's anchored to the vesicle through this RNA protein interaction. PABP in turn binds uh, the clover leaf like structure, and in addition, the viral polymerase uh, binds the clover leaf like structure as well. Then uh, VPG, remember, is uridylated on the Cree. Somehow it makes its way to the three prime end, which is already shown here at the, in the first panel. And that serves as a primer for RNA synthesis. And eventually the polymerase, polymerase is shown here as this blue U molecule wrapped around the VPG, will begin to extend the primer and make a full length minus strand. So the keys here are that the primer is a protein and that RNA synthesis requires the RNA to be circularized. If you change the RNA in a way that prevents circularization, you don't get any RNA synthesis. So you know, we always like to look at models of genome replication where the molecules are linear and the polymerase starts at one end or the other. Well, in this case, it's gotta be a circle. And then that result is a, a minus strand. And then this whole thing starts again to make another plus strand uh, from the minus strand. Now, as I said, this RNA synthesis occurs on membranous vesicles that are induced by viral proteins. And that's not just, that's just not the case for polio, but many other plus strand RNA viruses as well. They induce a variety of membranous vesicles. So here on the top left is an uninfected HeLa cell. Uh, we have lots of endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus there. But in a polio infected HeLa cell, after about four hours, all the ER and Golgi membranes are gone and they're repurposed to form these double membrane vesicles, which you can see. And it's on their surfaces that the viral RNA synthesis occurs. Those little dots, by the way, are new poliovirus particles that have been made in the cell. Same thing happens in cells infected with other RNA viruses. On the lower left, we have a flavivirus infected cell uh, where this is an electron micrograph showing these vesicles, round vesicles derived from the ER on which viral RNA synthesis occurs. Uh, and here on the right is a a graphic interpretation of the EM in the red are the virus particles being made. And then on the right, coronaviruses, another group of plus-stranded RNA viruses, they also induce membranous vesicles in cells on which RNA synthesis occurs. Why this happens is a bit of a puzzle. Some people think it's because reactions are more efficient when you concentrate the reagents instead of having them float around the cytoplasm. But there's also some thought that this may shield the viral RNA from the innate immune system. All right, our next question is, which is a part of the poliovirus replication strategy? The production of subgenomic mRNAs, de novo without primer initiation of RNA synthesis, circularization of template for initiation of RNA synthesis, all of the above. Well, the answer is C, circularization of the template. That's clear, I showed you that. Subgenomic mRNAs, absolutely not. Why? Because I said the genome and the mRNA are exactly the same. So there's no subgenomic RNA. Uh, de novo initiation, oh, it's VPG prime, which I just showed you, the protein primer. And so those are out. It's just circularization, not all of the above. Now, the other group of plus strand viruses I want to talk about on the right are the alpha viruses. And why this is interesting is because they make a subgenomic mRNA. I want to show you an example of that. They have a plus stranded RNA genome, which looks very much like those of the Flavi and, and Picorna viruses. Uh, but this genome replicates through a negative strand, and that plus-stranded RNA that comes in the cell can be translated, so there's no polymerase in these particles. But during replication, a subgenomic RNA is made to make the structural proteins. Inevitably, someone asks, why does this happen? And I don't know, it works, is the only thing I can tell you. You, you could say everyone should be, every virus should be like the plus-strand strategy of the Flavies and the Picornas, but this one has evolved and it works. So let's see how this goes in cells. These viruses, by the way, what's a toga virus or an alpha virus? Sindbis, some leaky forest virus, chikungunya virus. Maybe you've heard of chick that's been in the news lately. These are all alpha viruses, enveloped plus stranded RNA viruses. These bind receptors taken up 
into cells by endocytosis. The RNA gets out in the cytoplasm when the endosome acidifies. Uh, then the RNA is translated. It's a plus-strand RNA, but only part of the RNA is translated. And what's translated is the left-hand part from which the polymerase is, is made. And these proteins, one, two, three, four, all make a complex that can replicate RNA. It's the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And so those will take the incoming plus strand and copy it into a negative strand and into more plus strands. And of course, those full-length plus strands end up getting packaged into new virus particles. But we've only made part of the genome, and so a subgenomic mRNA is made from the right third of the genome. And from that subgenomic mRNA, you make the structural proteins that capsid in the glycoprotein of the virus. Now, why they're separated, we don't know, because obviously you don't have to do this because the picornas and the flavies show that. It just has worked in its evolutionary niche. Here's an expansion of the genome so you can see what's going on here. The plus-stranded RNA genome is shown here, squiggly. So that is a five-prime cap. There's a three-prime poly A tail. Uh, when this plus-stranded RNA gets in the cell, it's translated to form the RNA polymerase. And the translation occurs up to a stop codon about halfway through the genome or so. Uh, and these RNA polymerase proteins go on and replicate the genome. They make a negative strand, which is a template for the production of more plus strands. But from the negative strand, the polymerase also makes a subgenomic mRNA. There's a promoter here, this red arrow, where the polymerase can initiate and make a capped polyadenylated mRNA. And from that, you get the structural proteins, the capsid and the glycoproteins. That's our plus strand strategy. Minus strand viruses, we have two groups. We have viruses with a single negative stranded RNA and viruses with segmented negative strand RNAs. We're going to start with, this, with the unimolecular negative strands. VSV is our model virus for this. Uh, these have a negative strand genome, which of course has to come in the cell complex with a polymerase because you have to be able to make mRNAs. Uh, the RNA is made, is copied to form mRNAs, and these are subgenomic mRNAs, which encode the proteins. Uh, then, in order to replicate, a plus-stranded full-length copy is made of the genome, which is then copied into a negative strand. So let's take a look at the strategy for VSV. This is a virus, again, that binds receptors taken up by endocytosis. The RNA gets out into the cytoplasm. That's where everything happens for this virus in the cytoplasm. Uh, from the RNA, which is an RNA protein complex containing the RNA polymerase of the virus, five subgenomic mRNAs are synthesized. Each of those encodes a protein of the virus. Uh, the biggest protein is the polymerase, which goes on and replicates the genome through a plus-stranded intermediate, of course. Uh, and then the other proteins are structural proteins that will give rise to the newly synthesized particles. So here we have an example of a negative strand genome, and you make subgenomic mRNAs. So here is a, a blow up of the genome itself. Again, the, the genome is wrapped up in the particle as an RNA protein complex. It's a nucleocapsid. Here's the genome, the negative strand, stretched out. And from it are made five mRNAs, subgenomic mRNAs, each of which encodes a separate protein. So the virus encodes five proteins. Each one is made from a separate capped and polyadenylated uh, messenger RNA. So let's see, and remember, you can't make a genome from these mRNAs. They're too short. So you have to make a full-length plus strand at some point so you can make more full-length minus strands. So this introduces some kind of a conundrum. How do you switch from making mRNAs, which are subgenomic, to full-length plus strands? And there is a mechanism I'm going to tell you about, but for these viruses that make a subgenomic RNA, you have to have a way to switch. Polio doesn't matter because the genome is the mRNA. You don't have to have a switch. But for these viruses that have subgenomic RNAs, you have to figure out how to stop making mRNA and make full length plus and then more minor strands. So the way this works is as follows. The RNA is shown here in the, in the brown line, comes into the cell coated in protein, nuclear protein, which are shown as the circles. Polymerase comes in with the genome. It is uh, associated with the three prime end and it starts to move. As soon as this gets into the cell, the polymerase moves down the negative strand and, and churns out these uh, subgenomic mRNAs. The, the polymerase goes down, makes one, stops, starts, makes another, stops, et cetera, and moves down the line and makes all of them. At some point, it stops making 
mRNAs and switches to full length plus strands, right? which it has to do in order to make more genomes. It needs more genomes to make more virus particles. The switch is determined by the nuclear protein. Early in infection, there's not much nuclear protein around. It's just what was coding the particle, uh, and then what is made by translating the N RNA. So when there's low nuclear protein, you favor mRNA synthesis. But as soon as levels of N protein rise, the newly synthesized N proteins bind the mRNA, and they act, they act as anti-terminators. They cause the polymerase to make a full-length plus strand instead of individual mRNAs. So late in infection, when you have plenty of N protein in around and you want to start making genomes for packaging, the switch occurs. And of course, from those plus strands, you then make a negative strand. That gets coated with N protein as well. And then those go into the newly synthesized viral particles. <laughs> and this is a, another view of how that happens. Remember I told you the polymerase starts at the 3 prime N, makes a gene, stops, makes another mRNA, stops. Uh, this is showing that in some detail. Here's the negative strand RNA at the top. The polymerase is bound to the 3 prime N. It first makes the N mRNA. And then there's an intergenic region where the polymerase stops. There's a termination sequence there. The polymerase pauses, and then it begins to make the next gene. It doesn't fall off. It simply reinitiates. So there's an obligatory sequence of transcription of each mRNA. Lastly, I want to show you how poly A is added to each of these mRNAs. And this is an even closer look at this area. Here is uh, the N mRNA to the left. And there in the middle, where I, where I show you all the bases, that's the intergenic sequence. This has the termination signal for the polymerase. So the polymerase has just finished making an mRNA. It's stopping at the intergenic sequence. And then it encounters a U7 sequence. There's seven U's here, and the polymerase begins to make A. And for some reason, probably there's a secondary structure in here. The polymerase can't move past. The polymerase sits there for a while and just churns out A's until it reaches uh, maybe 100 or 200 A's, and then it stops and moves on. And that's how you get your poly A sequence. So the whole poly A is not encoded in the genome, but rather is simulated by this little U7 sequence, which causes the polymerase. We call it stuttering. It starts to make A's and then makes more and more and more. And then it says, well, I've made enough of that, and then stops. OK, so that, that is VSV. Now we're going to move to influenza, which has a lot of similarities, except that the genome is segmented. And there's one other difference. Influenza virus replicates in the nucleus. This is very unusual for RNA viruses. There are a few others that do that. So it just goes to show that RNA viruses can replicate anywhere. Influenza viruses bind and are taken up by endocytosis. The pH drops. Fusion occurs. The RNA is in the cytoplasm. So that's one of the eight segments we're showing here. All of them go in the nucleus. Now, when you go in the nucleus, that's a problem because you have to make mRNAs. They have to be exported out. The proteins have to be made in the cytoplasm. And then some of the proteins have to go back in to the nucleus. That's why there's so many arrows on this slide. And it makes it complicated. But don't, don't blame me. Blame influenza virus. So here, for example, we have an RNA segment. It's negative stranded. It's coming in. Uh, it's being transcribed to mRNAs. Those go out into the cytoplasm. Some proteins are made. Some of the proteins need to come back. Eventually, the whole genome, not only is mRNA synthesis happening in the nucleus, but genome replication as well. Uh, and those newly synthesized RNAs have to be coated with protein. That's why you have to ship protein into the nucleus. Uh, they eventually get back out into the cytosol and give rise to uh, new virus particles. Well, let's see how the genome replication occurs for this virus. Here's a step back. That's the whole genome. Eight segments of RNA, one through eight, each of, one, each of which is copied to uh, a subgenomic mRNA that encodes a couple of, one or a couple of proteins. You can see some of these segments encode one protein. Some of them encode multiple. Uh, sometimes there is splicing of these mRNAs. So RNAs eight, 7 and 8 are spliced to give rise to alternative mRNAs that code for uh, different proteins. So there's a lot of flexibility in the translation strategy of this virus. But the key here uh, is just like VSV, each of these mRNAs is a subgenomic mRNA. So cannot be used to make more virus particles because it's not a complete copy. Here's a schematic of that. 
the genome RNA as it comes in in the particle is shown in brown here, the second line down. It is transcribed by the viral polymerase, which comes in with the particle to form an mRNA. The mRNA falls short of the three prime end of the template by about 20 bases. Transcription stops and it's polyadenylated. I'll show you how that happens in a moment. What's more, the five prime end of this message is primed with a primer. This is a primer dependent mRNA synthesis enzyme. The primer comes from cellular RNAs. What the virus enzyme does is to chop up cellular mRNAs and takes the cap plus the first 10 or 12 nucleotides that's shown here, host GP primer, and uses that as a primer for mRNA synthesis. So the five prime ends, the first 12 bases or so of all the flu mRNAs are derived from the cell. So there's no way you could make a new virus out of that. So we have to have a way to switch to full length copying, right? And that's what's happening here. At some point, you have enough nucleoprotein present. That's the protein that comes in bound to the RNA. Uh, that's produced by translation of the correct segment. That starts to bind the newly synthesized RNAs and it makes them extend all the way to the three prime end. They don't have a capped primer. They're just primed with an A and they go all the way to the three prime end of the genome. So that's a full length plus strand. Again, it's different from the message, which is short at one end and has cellular sequence at the other. The full length plus strand is exactly that of the minus strand and that can be copied again by the viral polymerase to make more negative strands. Those get incorporated into virus particles. So it's really the same as VSV in that you have subgenomic mRNAs and there's a mechanism involving a nucleoprotein to act as an anti-terminator so that you get full length copies uh, of those genome segments. Now the, the priming using a capped primer is very interesting. This has been called cap snatching because what the virus does here at the top is a cellular messenger RNA. And cellular messenger RNAs have a cap structure, which is a G linked to the first base in a five to five prime linkage, not five to three prime. That's why it's called a cap. So these viral uh, polymerases, flu polymerase cleaves uh, the mRNAs of the host about 13 bases downstream. And then this fragment is used as a primer for mRNA synthesis. There's a little bit of complementarity between the primer and the very uh, three prime end of the negative strand RNA. The primer hybridizes and then the polymerase extends. That's the green sequence here. So again, the primer is a primer dependent enzyme and the primer comes from uh, host messenger RNA five prime end pieces. Do not ask why this is so. We can't explain it, it works uh, and that's all there is to it. Lastly, let me explain how polyadenylation works. And this probably explains why the three prime end of the message falls short of the five prime end of the genome RNA. Now, most of the time, when you think of polymerase as copying RNAs, you think of an RNA and a polymerase moving down and making a new RNA. But we think what's happening here is the polymerase is stationary and the template is pulled through the polymerase. So here the template is the negative strand RNA shown in uh, brown or olive green. The five prime end is anchored to the polymerase by uh, protein RNA interactions. And as this, this is the active site of the enzyme, the second red dot. And as this uh, template is pulled through the enzyme, it's copied. So you have a five prime uh, plus strand being elongated. This is capped. The cap comes from the host cell primer. And as this RNA is pulled through the polymerase, you're making five prime end. But at some point, you can't pull anymore because the five prime end of the template's attached. It, the polymerase can't pull it through any longer. It just so happens that at, that at that point, there's a stretch of U's. The polymerase begins to add A's. It stutters, puts on 100 or 200 A's. That's the poly A tail. And then the product falls off. Nothing can be done. So well, that sequence between where the five prime end is bound to the protein and the, the active site, that's about 20 bases. And that's what's missing from the mRNAs. The enzyme can't copy it because it, it's it's uh, reached a point where the template won't move anymore. So that's how polyadenylation occurs. All right, our, ne our last question for today, how are influenza virus and VSV RNA synthesis similar? The switch from mRNA to genome RNA synthesis is controlled by an RNA binding protein. Polyadenylation occurs at a short stretch of U residues. Viral mRNAs are shorter than minus genome RNA or all of the above. <laughs>
The answer is all of the above. The switch is controlled by nuclear protein, RNA binding protein. Poly A occurs at a stretch of U. Viral RNAs are all shorter than the template for both flu and VSV. All right, the last group of RNA viruses for today are double-stranded RNA viruses, rheoviruses and rotaviruses. In the genome, in the capsid, is a, is for these viruses, segmented double-stranded RNAs. We're showing one of them here. They have a plus strand, which is messenger RNA, and a minus strand. But again, the ribosomes cannot access this plus strand. So with, if, if these were deposited into the cytoplasm, they would not be translatable. So what has to happen is these viruses have to carry into the cell an RNA polymerase to make mRNAs from this double-stranded template. And those mRNAs are shown here on the left. They're capped, uh, and they are translated into proteins in the infected cell. Now, at the same time, some of those uh, plus-stranded RNAs can be copied just once, and you make a new genome segment. So making an mRNA is, is halfway to making a new genome segment for incorporation into virus particles. So that's what happens in infected cells. That's why these viruses have protein in their particle. That's why they have a polymerase in their particle, because the genome is double-stranded RNA. We talked about how these viruses are double icosahedral shelled. They infect cells that are taken up by receptor-mediated endocytosis. The outer shell is taken away by proteases in the lysosome. Uh, and then the core particle penetrates out of the endosome into the cytoplasm. It's hydrophobic, so it's able to get out. Now, the core particle, so there are three particles. There's the complete virus, the intermediate particle, and the core. The core still has all the double-stranded RNAs in it, plus it has the viral RNA polymerase. The RNAs never come out of this particle. This, the double-stranded RNAs never leave the particle. What happens is the mRNA synthesis occurs right in the particle. And you can see in this image number six, little squiggly capped things. These are capped mRNAs which are being uh, put out of the virus particle. At each five-fold axis, there's a, what we call a turret, which is an opening into the interior of the particle. It allows NTPs to get in, and the polymerase is inside along with the double-stranded RNAs. The mRNAs are made in the particle, and they're shipped out into the cytoplasm. You may ask, why does this happen? I bet part of the reason is to, you know, double-stranded RNA uh, is very immunogenic. The innate, our innate immune system would react to it as foreign and make interferon, and that would be bad. So I bet part of the issue here is shielding the double-stranded RNAs from the innate immune system. So some of these single-stranded RNAs get out into the cytoplasm. They're translated into proteins. Uh, the proteins can be made to assemble new core particles. That's in the, step eight here. And they can be filled with mRNAs, single-stranded mRNAs. Uh, they can be made double-stranded. And then eventually these particles mature and leave uh, the cell. Now early in infection, if you want to amplify the number of replication sites, you can take some of these newly assembled core particles uh, and simply recycle them uh, through and have them make become double-stranded and then go back through uh, the mRNA synthesis pathway. So here's step nine. We've made the mRNAs double-stranded. They're now making uh, mRNA, which can make proteins, so you can amplify the whole system. So very interesting strategy. And when new mRNAs are captured in a newly assembled particle, that is made double-stranded by the RNA polymerase that's already uh, in the virus particle. Let me just summarize the particles. There's the infectious virus particle, the virion. It has uh, two shells, an external shell uh, and an internal one. So the external is, is most of the capsid up until that last orange layer. We have an intermediate or infectious subviral particle. It's missing the outer uh, red shell, uh, part of the outer shell. And then the entire outer shell stripped off gives you the core. And this is what uh, generates mRNAs in the cytoplasm. So it's full of double-stranded RNAs. And you can see each of the sets of double-stranded RNAs here. They're labeled large, medium, and small, depending on their size. In the virion, they undergo mRNA synthesis to make uh, mRNAs that each encode a different protein. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different proteins uh, for this particular virus. Again, all the mRNA synthesis comes, takes place in the particle. MRAs, of course, have to get out in order to be translated uh, in the cytoplasm. Uh, a group in, um, at Baylor a number of years ago uh, 
did some cryo-electron microscopy of uh, these re, uh, rotavirus particles in the process of synthesizing RNA. You can actually strip off the outer shell and add triphosphates and cofactors, and the enzyme in the particle will start to make mRNA, and it will extrude. And they took pictures of these particles and did image reconstruction, and that's what you can see in the upper left here. So uh, that's the, the, the last shell of the particle in blue, and inside would be the viral RNA. And you can see these little uh, pink areas are where the RNA is snaking out of the particle, and that's expanded on the right here. The pink is actually what they saw in their cryo-EM, and they interpret this to mean that the RNA comes out uh, through this five-fold axis of symmetry, and this is an mRNA, of course, and it goes out into the cytosol. So this, how many uh, five-fold axes of symmetry are there uh, in an icosahedral particle? Do you remember? Twelve. Very good. There's no double-stranded RNA virus with more than 12 segments. We think there's one segment at each five-fold axis associated with the polymerase. And, you know, we have 10 or 11, no, not more than 12, and maybe that's because of the constraint of icosahedral symmetry. You can only have one different one at each five-fold axis. So here's a five-fold axis sitting just beneath it in the capsid. There's a double-stranded RNA and an RNA polymerase ready to make mRNAs when this comes into the cell. I think that's a pretty neat strategy. I'm going to summarize what I've told you today, what I think is important. We've talked about RNA-directed RNA synthesis. We've talked about three kinds of RNA viruses, plus-stranded RNA, minus-stranded RNA, and double-stranded RNA viruses, the different overall strategies of replication. You should understand polymerase basics that NTPs are taken up and inserted in the active site to make a template-directed synthesis. You should understand where RNA synthesis occurs in the cell. Most of the viruses we've talked about, except influenza virus, the RNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm and on vesicles. The, the real viruses, it occurs right in the particle. And influenza virus, it occurs in the nucleus. Uh, you should understand what genome replication is and how that differs from mRNA synthesis. Does it? For some viruses, it's the same, right? For polio and the Flavy viruses, the genome is the mRNA. So when you make a genome, you're making mRNA. But for the other viruses we talked about, actually influenza and VSV, they're subgenomic mRNAs. For real virus, the mRNAs are a faithful copy of the genome, the double-stranded segment. So you should understand what genome replication is versus mRNA synthesis. And to do genome replication, you also need to have an intermediate strand. If it's a plus-stranded virus, you'd need a negative strand intermediate and vice versa. And finally, finally, understand how poly A is added to these mRNAs. For flu and VSV, we talked about stuttering of the polymerase at a U7 sequence. For polio, for example, the poly A is actually encoded in the genome. So the genome has 100 or 200 A's at the 3 prime N. When that's copied to a negative strand, you get 100 or 200 U's that gets copied again. So there's no stuttering there. The, the poly A sequence is actually encoded.